Now it's time to make the player move with code. Code will bring your game to life by giving nodes behavior, telling them how to act, how to respond to input, and how to interact with each other. In this lesson, you're going to make the player respond to keyboard input. And to do this, we'll talk about some of the most important built-in methods that Godot calls on your scripts. These are the ones that you'll use again and again to initialize things, update gameplay, and handle input. And then, of course, also to interact with physics. This lesson builds on the player scene that you just created in the last lesson. But if you skip that, it's okay. There's the starter and final projects that are on the GitHub repository that you can download or clone to follow along. Okay, so before we jump into any code, we're gonna set up the input map for the project. And you can do that by going to project, project settings, and picking the input map tab. This is where you define named actions like jump, fire, move forward. And each action can have one or more events that are bound to it. These are things like keys, mouse buttons, gamepad inputs, and even touch. Now the power here is that you set it up once and then you can check for that action in code no matter what control type the player is using. So this makes your system incredibly flexible. Now for the player movement, we're gonna set up four controls. Move forward, move backward, backward, move left, and move right. And then before we assign the events, I wanna point out this property that's configurable called a dead zone. Dead zone matters for analog inputs like joysticks or triggers, where the stick might not rest perfectly at zero, which can mess up your vector checks. Now the dead zone defines how much you can move before Godot considers it a real input. So tiny jitters are ignored, but deliberate movements are going to register. Now to add an event, you click the plus button, and then it's listening for input, so we can just type W. Do it again and type S. Oops, I always do enter. Left and right. Now that's it. You can hit close, save the project. And now let's add a new script and see something happen. And to do that, we already have a scripts folder here. You can just right click, go to create. If you don't have a script folder and you want it, go to folder. In my case, I'm gonna do script. And then under language, it usually defaults to GD script. So just make sure you're set to C sharp. And then for its inheriting, we're gonna do node 3D. And then name this player. And then we can open that up. Now, Godot has several methods that come out of the box that you can interact with. And we're going to talk about all of these in depth in a moment. But for now, to see something happen, override the method called ready. And then remove this line. And to print something to the console, it's gd.print. Oops. And then save it. Now, going back to Godot, if you were to run the game right now, nothing would happen. That's because the script needs to live on something that's in the scene hierarchy. So if we go to player and open it up in the editor, we can drag and drop this script into the script section of the inspector for the player. And sometimes you're gonna see this error. This inspector might be out of date. This has to do with how Godot was able to build .NET projects. Now you can resolve this one of two ways. You can either click the build or run. In our case, we'll run it. And then looking at the console, we can see hello world. In Godot, there are several methods that the engine will call automatically at specific moments in a node's life. These events act like hooks into the engine's life cycle, frame loop, physics, and input systems. You can override these methods on your scripts to run custom code. Now let's look at a few of the most common ones that you're gonna see. Let's start with lifecycle methods. These are all about when a node enters and exits a scene. As a quick refresher, in Godot, 
every scene is made up of a hierarchy of nodes that are organized into parent-child relationships. This is often called the scene tree. Now, Godot's life cycle starts with two setup methods. Enter tree is called when the node joins the tree, but the children might not be ready yet. And then ready runs once everything is in place, so it's a safe spot to grab any children or set references. Then the life cycle ends with exit tree, which fires right before the node leaves, which is perfect for cleanup. Next are input events, which flow through a pipeline. Once any stage consumes an event, it will stop and it's not going to continue any further. Input is called first. This runs for every kind of input, keyboard, mouse, touch, or controller. And if you don't handle the event here, it gets passed to UI controls. Things like buttons or text boxes. If the UI still doesn't use it, Godot calls one of two unhandled methods. The first is unhandled key input, which only cares about leftover keyboard events. It won't see mouse clicks or gamepad input, but it is handy and slightly more performant if you know you're specifically looking for a keyboard event. Unhandled input is the catch-all. It sees any event that has survived the pipeline to this point, keyboard, mouse, touch, or even controllers. And this is actually where most gameplay input tends to live. So the rule of thumb is, use input if you need first dibs before the UI, unhandled key input if you only care about the keyboard, and unhandled input if you want to safely grab everything else once the UI is done. Now the last group are frame update methods. Both take a delta time step to keep logic smooth across frame rates. Process runs every rendered frame, and this is really good for visuals, timers, or UI. Physics process runs at a fixed rate, synced with physics. So use it for your movement and your collisions. OK, so let's actually make the player move. We don't really need ready, so we'll delete that. And then rather than having you watch me type, I will just paste in the code and we'll walk through this. So first, node 3D is not the right node to inherit from. This should have been character body 3D because that gives us access to things that the character body 3D does. OK, now let's take a look at what's going on. At the top, we're storing an input direction as a vector 2. This will hold the raw input values for movement. And next, the method unhandled key input is being used because we want to capture keyboard input events that the UI hasn't already consumed. Inside, we'll call input.getVector, which is a helper that combines four actions. In this case, move right, move left, backward, and forward into a clean direction vector. Next is handle movement, where we check if input direction is zero. And if it is, we will clear the velocity to prevent the player from continuing to move. Otherwise, we will build a 3D movement vector from the 2D input apply a move speed, and assign it to velocity. Finally, in physics process, we call handle movement, and then move and slide. Both velocity and move and slide come from character body 3D. And this is what makes the movement system velocity-based. Instead of directly changing the position, we tell the body how fast it should move along with a direction, and then Godot's physics engine takes care of sliding, collisions, and interaction with the world. Now let's jump back into Godot and run our game to see the character move. And there we have it, front, forward, left, and right. OK, let's add the ability to rotate the player, which means we're going to need a few more variables, which also means that this is a good time to look at the export attribute. In Godot, you can display your script variables directly in the inspector by marking them with export. To keep things organized, you can also use export group. So for example, here I've made a movement group. And under it, I have two exported floats for base movement speed and rotation speed. And since they're marked as exported, we can adjust them in the inspector during runtime. I've also added another group called references, which is how I like to organize node references that I intend to assign in the inspector. OK, so real quick, if we pop back into the editor, 
to see our new export properties, we can see a warning message that the inspector is out of date. So since we're not ready to run, we can just hit the build button and that'll recompile our scripts. And now we can see here things like base movement speed, which we could change to 10 technically at runtime, and our rotation speed. And everything is organized into our headers. Now let's add in handle rotation. Now I think what we could actually do to clean this code up is, now that I'm reading it, we can fix this. So instead of storing the input direction, we should store the move direction. This would be a vector three. And then set that here. Um, there we go. And then now this is if move direction is equal to vector 3.0, and then this is move direction. That should be a lot cleaner. Yeah. Uh, same thing here. So move direction is vector 3.0, and then we can drop that. And then it's move direction and move direction. Okay, that's a little bit cleaner. Okay, that's definitely one of those moments where you just stare at your code for too long. Now let's take a look at what handle rotation is doing. So first thing is we're just making sure we have references and that they're actually moving. And then I think the more interesting stuff is target angle and smooth angle. So target angle is calculating, well, the target angle that the player should face based off of the movement direction. So the idea is that the player will rotate the direction that they're moving. And then smooth angle is basically making it so that we will smoothly interpolate from the current rotation to the target rotation, and that's using lerp angle. So what that'll do is prevent snapping from happening. It'll make it look a lot better. So then rotation is applying the smooth rotation only to the y axis and we're preserving whatever its rotation is for x and z since we don't want to impact those. Now the last thing is we want to handle rotation. Okay, that was definitely an unplanned code shift. So fingers crossed that works okay. Let's play our game and see. Backwards, forwards, left and right but there is no rotating. Let's have a look. We did not set the player model. That helps. So if we come over here, we can see base movement speed is actually too high. So we'll drop that button down to five rotations at six, but we don't have the player model, which would be the visual. So if we assign that, Now we can see the player rotate. For your challenge, try adding something to your scene that can be activated with a button push. For example, create a spinning obstacle, just maybe a simple pillar or a block that moves from one side of the room to the other when you push the Y button. Drop it into your level and then see how it changes the feel of things when you run around it. And in the next lesson, we're gonna look at debugging how to find and fix mistakes to make sure that everything works the way you expect.